this ENT offered her a upper and lower blepharoplasty, a facelift and neck lift for $9,000. And she paid cash and showed up at the med spa and surgery was performed in a room with the door open and she was told she would have light sedation and local anesthetic, but they said, sorry, we don't have any pills, uh, but don't worry, you don't need it. So she had no pills, no sedation, local anesthetic only, and her face was open for about four hours with people going in and out of the med spa, and she was just terrified and panicked the whole time. This is Med Spa Mayhem podcast all about the chaotic world of medical aesthetics. From Botox to lasers to IV bars, learn how to tell real versus fake, legal versus illegal, and safe versus potentially deadly. Hear the crazy stories inside the med spa world and find out what questions to ask and how to spot the people cutting corners. I'm your host, Dr. Kate D. Together we explore the wild west of medicine that is the aesthetics industry. Hi, welcome back to Med Spa Mayhem. I'm your host, Dr. Kate D. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Troy Woodman about facial plastic surgery and oculoplastic surgery and all the permutations. Troy, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you, Kate, for having me. So Troy went to undergrad at the University of Washington here in Seattle, then Baylor for medical school. Yeah, and- but- Baylor College of Medicine. And Houston, Houston. okay. Then did a residency in ophthalmology followed by a two-year fellowship in what is now called oculofacial plastic and reconstructive surgery. Did I get that right? Yeah, those are the the new terms, right. Well, thanks so much. I was hoping that we could talk all about what you do and how patients can figure out what path to follow if they want to do any kind of plastic surgery for their face. So just by way of introduction, Troy and I met about 10 years ago when I was first starting out in this business, and one of my good friends and colleagues recommended Troy as the guy to do any complicated cases, any redo cases, and so he became my guy for everything because if he's the best, then (laughs) that's who I refer to. So I've been sending patients to Troy for many years now. So can you describe what you do in your practice, the breadth of it, and what your favorite surgeries are? Yeah, so thanks. I, I uh, have a, a surgical practice. I don't do a lot of clinical medicine. And um, I specialize in facial plastics, as you said, and I do a lot of eyelid surgery based in my training in ocular plastics. But I've also now do probably one and sometimes two facelifts a week. And I've been doing that for four or five years now. It's been something that's become a big part of my practice. I do a lot of Mohs reconstructions for local dermatology and Mohs surgeons. And I still like to do some of the more complex reconstructive surgeries on everything from eyelid malposition to pediatric things and tumors. I just did an orbital fracture. I try to keep kind of a broad scope. I think that it keeps my skills sharp. I haven't kind of just done that gone down the route of purely cosmetic surgery, although it probably makes up 60 to 70% of my practice time. I still cut out about 30, 30% of my time to do reconstructive work. I'm based down here in Tacoma. We have a satellite office in Federal Way and now another one in Puyallup. Fantastic. And how long have you been in practice now? I think we're close to the same age. <laughs> yeah, we were at UW together when I was in general surgery. I think you were doing your residency there too. Yeah, I've been in practice in this office to help open the, well, I came in after my partner opened it a year into the business and I opened our satellites and I have been here now 24 years. So that's a very long time. So <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying that. I can't believe I'm saying that. 24 I years. Know, we're old, but that's okay. We're like at the top of our game. So, well, I wanted to tell you about this story that happened recently. So since I've been doing this podcast and have the book coming out, I had someone reach out to me after an experience a couple of weeks ago with an ENT who, what happened was she had gone to a med spa over on the east side of the Seattle area 
And this RN had seen her, totally separate topic, seen her independently without any medical director or good faith exam. But the patient wasn't particularly happy with her results. And the RN said, oh, well, you really need a facelift. And she recommended seeing an ENT who practiced surgery out of this med spa office. And so in the end, the patient went to see the ENT at a separate location, did a consult, and this ENT offered her a upper and lower blepharoplasty, a facelift and neck lift for $9,000. And she paid cash and she showed up at the med spa and the surgery was performed in a room at the med spa with the door open and she was told she would have light sedation and local anesthetic, but they said, sorry, we don't have any pills, but don't worry, you don't need it. So she had no pills, no sedation, local anesthetic only, and her face was open for about four hours with people going in and out of the med spa, and she was just terrified and panicked the whole time. Uh, She ended up getting a mild infection, went to the ER about day five or six post-op, and she was just crying, she said, for days because it felt like torture. And she asked me, was this normal or legal? (laughs) What's normally done? And I'm like, I am not a plastic surgeon and I don't know what the normal process is, but that sounds horrific to me. So I, I was hoping you could just say in general what the consult process should be, what that kind of surgery generally entails and what kind of anesthesia. And is this kind of, it just sounded a little bit fly by night to me. And I don't really know the going rate of all that, but for a four-hour surgery, I mean, I think that's a lot in four hours too. I don't know. So can you sort of comment on that overall story? Yeah. I mean, first of all, that goes back to what your mom told you, or if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. It's one of those things that it seems, in answer to the questions that she had, is it legal? Unfortunately, it probably is. There's really not a large hurdle to jump over to make it, quote, legal, in, in the sense that the state of Washington has rules on just about everything, but not as many on cosmetic surgery as you would think. There would be no state agency that could come in and say that it's illegal. They might come in and shut you down. They might come in and say you're not following sterile technique protocols. But if you're not trying to certify a center and you're just doing this in your office, there's really no state agency. If you make no claims, the state isn't going to really check into that too much. Where this doctor might have a problem or this clinic might have a problem is is just what you said. She ended up with an infection. So if this turns into some sort of problem, the place that did it and the doctor that did it don't have a lot of ground to stand on them because they they haven't followed the standard of care, right? That's the thing we're all held accountable to is what is the standard of care? And that is definitely not normal, another way of standing the standard of care. The standard of care is to be in a sterile environment, whether this is an office-based surgical center, it doesn't sound like this is no, at all. It's it just like a, it's a, yeah, room, a room in a med spa. In a med yeah. spa. So that is absolutely not normal. It is completely outside of the standard of so care. So just for our listeners, the definition of standard of care, it's really essentially related to malpractice. And that is what a you know reasonable doctor would do. And over the years for each given thing that we do in medicine, there's this sort of reasonable standard of care. And if you don't meet that, then that can be grounds for a malpractice law. So I think that's where this doctor and this med spa are leaving themselves exposed. Now, if you're the patient who you don't really care about them, You care about yourself and you're like, well, I've just been through this horrendous experience. First of all, surgery is scary for anyone. I don't know. I've had a couple of surgeries. It's terrifying. And to have no, to act like this surgery that she underwent is some routine, is akin to some sort of filler or Botox treatment, which is still scary for some patients, right? It's needles. It's a procedure and needs to be taken seriously and, and sterile technique. All these things need to be observed. A surgery is even one higher than that. It may be three higher than that. And, and it really needs to be treated with a great deal more care. And I think that the way this was handled seems very fly by night and put this patient at a lot of risk. 
It's certainly something that I would never attempt to do with just a local anesthetic, which is clearly what they did. Even though we use local anesthetic, anytime I'm doing this surgery, I'm using either a conscious sedation or a general anesthetic. Yeah. And it's my understanding though, so if you use just a local and some pills, you don't need to be in a surgery center. And I don't know about conscious sedation, but anything more than that, for sure, you have to be in a surgery center. Isn't that correct? Yeah. I think anytime you have, honestly, I think for aesthetic surgery, you might not have to be, Kate. I, I don't think that's something that is stipulated that says if you're going to have that, you're required to be anywhere else. No, I just else. mean Although it's related to the level of right. anesthesia, I thought. Yeah. And I think you have to have at least one. And I'm, I have my own surgery center. Most surgeons do. Most reputable surgeons I know, many of them are ENT-based uh, facial plastic surgeons. We have our own centers and we spend a lot of, a great deal of time, money, and energy making sure that these are up to par with not only the state, but also federal regulations. And most importantly, everything we do in there is designed to make our patients comfortable and right. safe. And surgery centers are very highly regulated. So if you stay out of a surgery center or an operating room in a hospital, then there's really very little regulation. Nobody's going to come and inspect well, it. Not only there's not much regulation, there's very no, there's no right. oversight. No, nobody's taking, I am subject, we just had one. We have pop inspections by the state at, well, at the state and federal level, and we can make claims that we are certified. And there's a whole litany of certifications. I'm not going to get into the myriad of different certifications one can have, but any of these certifying bodies, some of the more common ones are AAA AHC, Quad AHC. Do you see a surgical center that's Medicare approved? That's extremely hard mm -hmm. to get. Now, most aesthetic practices are not going to go to that trouble because they're mainly doing cosmetic surgery. Sure. And they don't participate with Medicare. I actually do reconstruction, so we have a Medicare certification. And that's really the highest level because, it's a, as you can imagine, it's a federal government. Sure. But you should look for a surgeon that has their own center. That just doesn't speak just to quality. It also speaks to volume. Anybody that does a fair amount of surgery, which is important uh, and has a high level of experience, is usually busy enough to have their own center. Right. Um, and so if you're a, a plastic surgeon doing a lot of surgery... You'd be crazy not to have your own surgery center. You'd be beg borrowing and stealing at any point you could to get a room or get a, a location to do a surgery. This person has found a way around that and they're just going to medical spas and doing surgeries, which I think is absolutely ludicrous. I, and I, I, I'm a little bit surprised that they'd be willing to tackle that. And I, I don't know who this person is. And, and it's terrifying to me to think there's doctors out there doing that. And so... In the consultation process, if I'm a patient, I would very much be asking my surgeon, where do you operate? Is your, do you have a surgical center or do you go to a hospital? What are the certifications you have? What is your level of experience? I would ask about anesthesia providers. If the answer to, do you provide anesthesia or have anesthesia providers? And they don't have to be anesthesiologists, in my opinion. We have both anesthesiologists and CRNAs which is a certified registered nurse anesthetist, but they go through extensive training and actually can, and in the state of Washington, are recognized as independent contractors that they can provide anesthesia care, but they go through a very significant training program with credentialing processes that are really, I'm not going to say at all that they're going through the same process that an anesthesiologist goes through, but they are, very they are well, yeah. they're, they're very well trained and can work alone. So if I was going to a center and I was considering a surgery, I'd want to make sure that surgeon has a surgical center or a very safe and well-recognized and credentialed place of surgery. Or, and I would want to make sure that they have uh, anesthesiologists or CRNAs available to provide some level of sedation, whether that's anywhere from just conscious sedation or even the pill thing is something that I'm not quite sure what they were going to give her. Maybe some pain tablets, pain pills. Yeah. Were they going to give her a, a, a benzodiazepine? Her benzo, so like a Valium or Xanax type yeah. med. And either just that or maybe that plus fentanyl or something. Yeah. Like and I think where this doctor is making mistakes, especially when it comes to a facelift, is you're working near some fairly significant blood vessels if you're doing it 
you know, the way I think it should be done. And so if you're, if you encountered significant bleeding, you wouldn't have, for instance, things that like, that you would need like suction. Uh, and if you had gone into a situation where you had to do some sort of intervention that, that was, let's call it unnumbable, what are you going to do? The patient's is at this point at your mercy and you have to do what you have to do to, to protect the airway or control bleeding. And now you're, you caught with your pants down because you have no backup. You have no suction to see and having done hundreds of facelifts and eyelids and thousands of eyelid surgeries, the degree of human variability never ceases to amaze me. You can find the strangest things and yeah. if you, and you know, this, and so you get, you want to always be thinking as a surgeon, what if, what am I prepared for just about anything? And that's a, as a surgeon, it's just, it boggles my mind that somebody would go in and, and tackle a surgery like this as if it's just some little in office procedure. It just tells me that this doc, this particular doctor really doesn't understand the potential risks of this operation. And that really tells me then that this person is not experienced. Yeah. And how experienced can they be if they're... Anybody that's really experienced is going to say, if you ask me to do this in a situation, can you do this? I, don't, I, want, I get this all the time. I don't want to pay for anesthesia or I want to save money. Then you've got to go somewhere else. Because if you want me to do your surgery, I'm going to do it the way that, that I feel is the safest and most tested time-tested way of doing it and and having done this many reps and having done it a certain way so many times i know what's safe i know what leads to success and i'm not going to change from that to make it less expensive now my question to you did you ever ask this patient was she really concerned about price or was this like the only consultation she had i don't think that she looked anywhere else she just she just trusted the, nur the nurse injector whoever did her treatment I yeah. Okay. So you should probably ask a few more questions, but they trust us and we're doctors. They trust that everything's going to be fine and that everybody's well-trained. It's like getting on an airplane. You don't ask your pilot how many <laughs> times they've landed this thing. And I think patients, yeah. we, they have an opportunity and an obligation to themselves to ask people. Right. I think that for people who are trying to save money, just because you probably could get away with things doesn't mean that it's safe to do so because if you are the 1% of a disastrous outcome, then, and you're a busy guy, so 100 surgeries, if one out of every 100 were like a disaster, you wouldn't do that thing, whatever it is, right? Like you'd need to make sure that you don't take risks with people's lives, especially when it's cosmetic and elective. It's our mandate. It's, yeah. it's what we, it's our, as a doctor, it's kind of like we swear where we're always going to do that. And so, and, and I think it does get cheapened or dummied down a little bit, Kate, with aesthetic medicine because it's cash based and it almost just seems like you're doing the, like, I don't know, it's almost more like a business transaction. You can never forget this is real medicine. Yeah. It's dumbfounding. I think to people like us who I always say come from real medicine, right? So we were in like really serious stuff and then you're doing something now that's 100% elective and cosmetic. However, nothing, my mantra for 10 years has been nothing in aesthetic medicine is worth any permanent harm. It's just not worth it. Okay. So I just interviewed a, a patient who is on the podcast recently who has, is, she's completely permanently disfigured from a filler a vascular occlusion and she lost half her nose. And when I just think some of the details of that case were just kind of egregious. And I just think we don't take chances with people like that. And it's one thing if you're trying to save someone's life, if there's a 1% risk of something bad happen, but meanwhile, the person's trying to die, well, go do it, right? <laughs> but when you're doing an elective procedure, it should be done properly. And I think that there's always going to be a certain subset of people who are going to go to Mexico or somewhere for surgery because it's cheaper there. But I don't think that most people want to risk their lives to have something like a facelift done. Well, if we just, let's just for the point of making this clear for your listeners, I think if this patient were going to do it all over again, here's what she should have done. 
Do you know she met the surgeon before she had the surgery? She did, yeah. As far as I understand, okay. it was a different location, though, not at that med spa. So I would, and I get this all the time, and I've been here long enough that, that I get patients all the time that have seen four surgeons. <laughs> They've interviewed me and Sam. I can give you five names, and many of them are ENT surgeons. I have great respect for them. I want to make it clear for your listeners, ENT surgeons are most of the time very masterful and understand the anatomy of the head and neck absolutely as better than most so just because this doctor was an ent surgeon doesn't mean that's why she did this i think that she's probably new she's trying to build a practice she probably building a surgery center by the way is two or three million dollars so not <laughs> every surgeon is going to have the ability to do that and so if you're trying as a new surgeon to become busy, you are trying to make a living. You can't beat somebody up for that. What the patient should have done though, because this is something that we're talking, I'm assuming your listeners are future or prospective patients, is you have to really go in and, and before your consult, write down, what am I wanting to achieve here? What do I not like about my face? And that surgeon better or well sit down with you, examine you carefully and go through those that problem list with you. Or at least go in and say, what do you think, doctor, This and, and itemize each thing and then describe to that patient what you mean. I think you need eyelid surgery isn't very helpful, <laughs> okay? What I do is I have, one of, I'm, I'm fortunate because I have 25 years of experience now, right? So I can literally show you thousands, and I have it on my iPad, and I bring it out digitally, and I say, here, this is somebody I think looks like you when I go through 30 pictures of my patients, okay? Mm -hmm. These are my cases. And I show them before and after. Say, this is how I think you relate to this patient. This is what I think a blepharoplasty for you would look like. And then I hand them a mirror and I kind of use either my hands or a little cotton tip applicator. And I try to show that patient at that time exactly what I mean. I'm not a big fan of digital software because I, I think that can be deceiving. I've never been one of these that, I don't know if you know about these things, Kate, where you can, Morph. Oh, yeah. I don't love them either. Yeah, they're a morphing software, and, and you could basically show anybody anything you wanted. I'm just more of a fan of showing a person in real time with a mirror. And then I listen, and I let the patient ask some questions, and that consult might take an hour. Mm -hmm. And so by the end of the consultation, that patient has a really clear understanding of not only my level of experience and aesthetic values, because they've seen all my photos, like real time, not doctored Photoshop photos. And it's very obvious my photos, they're all non flash photos. And I certainly am showing my best work for sure, but it's enough of a volume that people feel confident. And then, two, they understand exactly what I think they need, how it relates to what they came in to see me for. And then I've described to some degree the procedure. And I think if that woman would have asked that, it would have been very natural for her to say, now, wait a minute, I'm going to be awake for all this. Because <laughs> if you just say, I'm going to do a little tuck and I'm going to do this and I'm going to, I'm going to do that. Okay, great. Let's do it. But when you start saying, well, I'm going to make an incision right here and then I'm going to take out some fat and I'm going to sew this up. I'm going to basically peel the skin away to expose the underlying framework of your face. I mean, I'm going to then make a flap of that and redrape it all back up to restore your jawline and then I'm going to put a drain in and then I'm going to, why are you going to put a drain in? Well, because there can be bleeding. See, this is how this would at some point trigger the patient to understand, because even though you don't want to hear this, sometimes you need to know what you're getting yourself into. So the patient does have to take some responsibility. Now, but with good doctors like you and me, Kate, we just bring it up anyway. Like, I know you don't want to hear this, but I'm going to tell you, Yeah, you know, I'm sure in your filter consultations, you have those conversations about, Absolutely. well, these are the things that can happen and they're very rare. And I know what, and what you then say is, I know how to, I know, you know what how to do. deal with that if it were to happen. I know how to deal with it. And that's yeah. the next question they should ask. So, so I think in a consultation, a patient should be looking for somebody that has a center to operate in, or at least a safe location that's mm -hmm. recognized either by a state agency, a federal agency but it can't just be a room. Yeah. Two, the doctor has to show some level of understanding of what they're there for and be able to verbalize and describe clearly to you as a patient, young or old, because there's old surgeons that aren't very good at this. And you have to be able to say, so that you're connecting. 
so that yeah. you're understanding what exactly are you doing and why are you doing it? So that then you have this rapport. And then I think you have to decide, do you like your surgeon? Because if things go well, it doesn't really matter. But when things go sideways or if there's a complication, you're going to be spending a lot of time with that doctor. <laughs> if, if they're good, if, if they're bad, maybe they send you down the road. And so you have to have an appeal. You don't have to be madly in love with your doctor, but you have to feel like, yeah, I trust this man or woman. I think that's it's a very important connection yeah. that we have. And I think that is it's really important when you're making a big decision. Yeah. And you have to trust the doc and you have to feel like they're being honest with you. And you have to feel like you have that connection that you feel comfortable going through with something as big as a, a surgery. Or even little things like Botox and filler. I think those are little, but I think those are equally important. And I think if it's just a patient like this, it's a little more timid and doesn't really know what to ask. A good surgeon with a lot of experience is going to bring most of this to the forefront during the consultation. So the consultation, you can kind of weed a lot out. Yeah, I don't connect with this mm -hmm. person. This person, and I it's just, I don't get a good vibe. Two, clearly this doctor has enough experience in these things that I'm interested in and has offered me a, a clear uh, and concise explanation as to what we're trying to do here. And this person has the- I'm, I'm curious, how long would those four things take you to do? An upper and lower blepharoplasty well, facelift in that? And there's slight degrees of variability, but I know when I schedule these cases, I have, I know an upper lid blepharoplasty and I've done literally 12,000, takes me 20 minutes. I mean, if you add my fellowship and write all of it up, I mean, it's a lot. And lower lids, I don't know, thousands. That takes me an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. And it's my technique, which is different than most, by the way. So a lot of people just take okay. some fat out. And that's not, doesn't mean it's wrong, but that's a quicker case. I'm always trying to leave fat in the face as well as I do volume. Yeah. Important. So take the kind of older fashion technique of just taking fat out doesn't really we're all trying to put fat back in. So, so that's, that, if anybody with a modern skill set would be not doing that anyway. But upper and lower left should take anywhere between an hour to hour and 45 minutes. If it went two hours for some surgeons that are newer, that's fine. But an upper and lower left shouldn't take 30 minutes. A face and neck lift is variable. And that's because that surgery has so many different ways you can do it. I do a technique called deep plane. It happens to be all the rage right now, but I've been yeah, doing it. Yeah. And interestingly, I do believe that's what she believes she had. And she may have had that. Yeah. And there's no way to know on the time. And surgeons are, are, in terms of their level of skill, their level of competence, their level of dissection, it's super variable. And all of us do it differently. I'm me. I'm extremely meticulous. I do all my own sewing. I don't have residents or fellows. I don't have anybody helping me sew, whereas a lot of surgeons do. A facelift takes me on average somewhere between four and five hours, just the face and neck lift. Now, when I do a facelift, I'm not, I'm usually opening the neck. I'm doing a, a, a periauricular incision. Like for me, and I'm doing a deep plane dissection. I'm doing usually some laser resurfacing. And so for me, I kind of look at it as my morning. It happens to be my Tuesday morning, most Tuesdays. Okay. And then I'm often do it, or I'll do a brow lift that takes about, so, so the fact that she did all that in four hours is really speedy. That's remarkable then. However, I know there's good surgeons out there that, that probably could do that. They're just, they work for speed and that's kind of how they do it. And they're different than me. So I'm not going to say when I think this over, I don't think that alone is the issue. I think it would be very hard to do a really thorough job with that without proper lighting, proper retractors, not having an assistant, not having suction. Mm -hmm. So my gut feeling on this, and again, I'm, I don't have any knowledge of op node or anything. It would surprise me if she did the surgery I do. Yeah, I, I don't think physically possible. In that kind of time frame. I, I don't think you could, and I think that's impossible. And I just went to a meeting in Vancouver where a lot of facial plastic and, and general plastic surgeons spoke, and I saw their technique. And they might say they're in there for four <laughs> hours, but they have fellows right. doing the closure. The closure is what takes all the time. Yeah. 
they do the dissection and the harder part and then the fellow closes how that goes so so there there's differences in time and i don't let that i wouldn't let that in terms of your listeners seeing other surgeons in our community, there might be some that can do that. Sure. And if they can show you results and lots of photos and they have a safe center, don't let that stop you. Now, pricing is what really surprised me. That's extremely low huh? in terms of what the price would be. That surgery in my office would be somewhere between, that'd probably be twenty to $25,000. Yeah. And that that seems closer and to that's what Tacoma. I would have guessed. Yeah. And, and Bellevue, I'm not going to name <laughs> names, somebody I really like, that's 70. Oh, wow. Okay. In LA, that's 100. So, wow. So, so $9,000 you're saying. A hell of like a deal. Like drive through level. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. And again, I mean, the third, by the way, with aesthetic medicine, there's no, your listeners should know, there's no rules. It's the one well, you can charge whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah, there's no now, with a back surgery or a brain surgery or a breast surgery, any of those surgeries that your insurance pays, there are set fees and there's a whole book, and you know, yes. it, it's called the CPT, but yeah. that, there's no changing those numbers in aesthetic medicine. You can do whatever you want, right? Whatever the market will bear for the low, the lowest, or, lower, you want. or, or cutting whatever and, corners and you I, want to try to give someone a cheap product. It's like diluting Botox, right? Same thing. Yeah. Well, See, I don't think diluting Botox makes any sense because you're just going to have very unhappy customers and they're not going to come back. Well, same, right? Same thing here. You're going to see, <laughs> by the way, I don't know about you and I'm a doctor and so are you. 9,000 bucks <laughs> is a lot of money. And if I spent yeah. 9,000 bucks and I wasn't happy, and that's the thing, that's the thing this doctor needs to understand is she is now completely beholden to this patient's expectations. And I guarantee you, this woman did not give her $9,000 and expect kind of crappy work. Right. Well, I think what nice concerned result. her the most was the open room. So she was worried about infection. No, and then well she felt like she was tortured. And then when I mentioned this case to another friend, she thought it sounded a lot like Hannibal Lecter, right? Like where you're paralyzed and he's like eating your brains. But like basically you can't move and someone's got your face. Well, think about it. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Have you ever had local anesthetic? It hurts. Heck, it hurts so bad to get a numbing shot. You would literally be giving hundreds of numbing shots during the course of this four hours. And constantly and, for four hours because it doesn't last. Well, you can put Marquette in there and that can last four or five hours. But still, every one of those shots is going to hurt. Even if you buffer it, if you buffer the pH with bicarbonate, it's still going to hurt. And Every one of those you're going to be wide awake for. And I think that's actually inhumane to put through somebody through. Yeah, just and, and just terrible. There's a famous company that's no longer a business out there. This is called Lifestyle Lift. And they were a company started on Madison Avenue. I mean, this was a marketing gimmick company that went out and hired doctors. And they appealed and advertised to patients. And then they'd come to our meetings and advertise to us. And this is where they went to dentists and family doctors. At least your doctor that you're talking about is a near nose and throat doctor. And what was a lifestyle lift as defined by them? Lifestyle lift was a small incision facelift. Okay. And it was a way for doctors and it was usually, it, it was geared towards your nose and throat, oculoplasty. Anybody that wanted to do more of these procedures could go and go to this weekend course and become lifestyle lift certified. Well, now you could hang a shingle on your door. I am lifestyle list certified. And you would be on a website. And then they would have mass meetings in metropolitan markets. And they would hold meetings and show photos. And patients would come for free for lunch and have a, a seminar. And then at the end, hey, if you sign up today, you can have a lifestyle lift for, I think it was 8500 bucks, 7500 mm. bucks. And then they would take the names. And then they would divvy those names up with these doctors that took their course. And some of the doctors, by the way, took the course were good surgeons. They just weren't busy. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying everybody that did lifestyle lifts was bad, but there were a lot of bad doctors doing lifestyle lifts. And lifestyle lift w was patented in the sense that they had to have some sort of technique-based patent so that they could name it and own it. Right. And so that's what they did. Why they're out of business is because is for multiple reasons, but one of which is they had a high complication rate. 
and they were doing things in rooms like this. There's stories of them doing it in hotel rooms. Oh, wow. And that, that's this isn't about all that them. different. And, doing it in a regular yeah. room of a med spa is like right. any But I will say at least this doctor is an ENT. And so she's going to have to, another, she understands the anatomy at least. These were dentists and family docs. They weren't even surgeons. Okay. Yeah, and they were doing these lifestyle arrests. And then if there were complications, and that's another thing I want to talk about next. If there were complications, they didn't know how to deal with them. And so that plus the fact they what they actually shut them down was a, a claim the federal what is it trade federal trade commission. commission and there it was false advertising because they were showing all these great results but these patients were actually having full face and neck lifts they weren't having that patented lifestyle lift mm. so the photos that they were showing for lifestyle lift weren't actually lifestyle lift so that's what got them shut down well that, that practice however is rampant in both aesthetic medicine non-invasive and in plastic surgery there's nothing controlling. I mean, there is. It's against the law to falsely advertise, but. It's a way to get around having real certification. And that's my point to your listeners is yeah. just because you're certified in something doesn't make you good at it. What makes you good at it is experience and having, you have to have certification. Listen, I don't want to make it sound like you don't, but the, the inverse is not true. Just because you're certified and have actual ABMS board certification doesn't mean you are qualified if you don't have a safe center and you don't do a consultation properly and you leave the doors open, you could still be board certified, right? You could still be board certified, mm -hmm. but that's still not the best and safest practice. Right. You should find somebody that's board certified. And yet that's really confusing. And that's what you're talking about is these certifications from the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery, the, this lifestyle, of, it looks like you're certified. It looks like it's legit, but really it doesn't count for much. Yeah. Like the patient goes, oh, he or she is certified. So he oh. must be safe. No, he's, that doesn't mean that. It's just. A so for our listeners, and we went over this in the last week's podcast, but basically board certification is what happens after you finish residency training, which can be many years. And then people do fellowships on top of that, which can be several years. And then you usually sit for the boards of that fellowship. So it's many years of training that goes into a real certification. But then there are these alternate entities that try to create certificates for things that are in no way equivalent to many years of training. And so if you see someone who calls themselves a cosmetic surgeon, Again, we've talked about this in the past on this podcast. There is no such thing as just a cosmetic surgery fellowship that's real, that's based in years of training with a board exam at the end. And so if you are a plastic surgeon, like your partner who does full body plastic, say it's many, it's like a five-year residency plus two-year fellowship, and it's many years of training. Whereas for you, you were, you did ophthalmology, which is, well, you do four, four. years and then. Another, you did, I did a year of general surgery. Right. And then so, so general was, surgery, was then ophthalmology. ophthalmology, then another two year oculoplastics and reconstructive surgery. So it's like and many, all, many years. And every one of those steps for all of us, just so you know, and I, I don't, you didn't do a surgical specialty, but we have to go and keep a log of every case yeah. and you have to have a certain number of every single case before you can even sit for your boards. And then you have a written and an oral exam. And then you come out and you really don't have a lot of experience. <laughs> right, then you've got a story. Like even, and that's where you really cut your teeth. That's where you really learn what you're doing is going to somebody right out of practice isn't a bad thing, but I can tell you I'm a much better surgeon now than I was 25 years ago. And I wasn't bad, but I just didn't know what I didn't know. Right. It's experience, right? And it's the best teacher. So you, I think both components are really important. I think you also need to find a surgeon, and, and this is where this conversation is germane, is none of those people know how to manage the complications that can come with these problems. There isn't an eye complication that you can have after eyelid surgery, which is one of the most commonly performed facial plastic surgeries that I can't handle myself. Yeah. You name it, I can, I know what to do. And this is why I don't do rhinoplasty, Kate, because <laughs> I don't know how to manage the complications. Right. And your nose and throat surgeon would know how. 
And with face lifting, I've done so many of those, even though I didn't do an extensive amount of those 25 years ago at UCLA, I've now done so many and I feel very comfortable with the process that I know how to manage the complications. So for me personally, and I think for any surgeon, I sit down with each person that I'm about to do surgery on and I tell them that these are the complications that we can see. And this is what I do about them. And I think that's another important question to ask your surgeon. What if there's a problem, doctor? What can we do about it? And if the doctor doesn't have an answer, if the, if the doctor's answer is, well, I'll send you to an ophthalmologist. Right. <laughs> or I would send you to it. Like, if they don't know how to manage these complications, I my personal bend, and this is not required by the state or any other body, I don't think that person should do that surgery. Yeah, well, to handle your own surgical complications, I mean, unless it's right. something very that's, usual. That seems basic, right? Yeah. It doesn't seem basic. You'd be surprised. And this is across all fields, not just these cosmetic surgeons. There are board-certified surgeons who don't know how to manage the complications of different surgeries. So so you have to find somebody that I think is board-certified in an ABMS specialty. I think it's something that that's, that is, you, you have to have that. But on top of that, you need to make sure that doctor knows how to handle the complications that could arise from those surgeries. And I think that's where this doctor who did this procedure in this room, if there had been an intraoperative complication, yeah, I don't think I, she would have had any way to, to get her patient out of I, that problem. I can't even imagine. I can't. I, I think that one of the essential things that we've talked it's about- It's pretty cavalier, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, in this podcast several times, many times, is that you don't know what you don't know. And unless you have extensive education, then if you're just ignorant of a possibility, then you won't even know that piece of your knowledge is missing. And one of the most important things for me when I was starting down this journey is that I am not a surgeon. And so I learned how to you know, treat complications of filler and, and other things. Mostly it's filler really is the biggest thing in yeah. our practice. Yeah. But for me, it was absolutely critical to meet someone like you, actually have two two oculoplastic surgeons that I know that God forbid I need to call you because I can't go and do surgery on people. And I also don't have access to hyperbaric oxygen in my office, but I know when I need to call you. Right. And luckily I've never had to do that. Thank God. I'm like knocking on the wood right now. But, but I think that's another thing that, that happens in a lot of aesthetic clinics is that they have no idea. And when the disaster does happen, they don't know what to do. And they don't have anybody to call. And especially these people operating sort of on the fringes, they can't just call someone like you because you're going to be like, who the heck are you and why did you touch somebody? I mean, I, I guess, you know. Well, we would help them, but sure. we wouldn't be happy about it. <laughs> and really what would happen is we'd probably be out of touch or busy or, and you'd end up going to an ER and then you're relegated to the ER wait. I have no idea. Whoever's on call, yeah. whoever's on call for plastic surgery that night. So, yeah. and I don't even participate in that stuff anymore. <laughs> I'm not good at getting out of bed at two in the morning anymore. So I would just say that those are basic principles to look for and ask questions. For. And I'm not trying to say that just because you don't know how to manage a retrobarbar hematoma, you shouldn't do blepharoplasty, but you should yeah. at least know what to look for. And you should at least need, you at least need to know that it's a Pressing, I get called in by attorneys all the time to be an expert witness, and I don't really like doing that. But there are some really just things that get missed because people are doing surgeries and procedures that that they really have no business doing, and it happens more than you think. I find this case, I think this would be a really rare situation that you found yourself here, and hopefully this lady will be okay. I, mean, I think she is I think she is okay. I do think that if there had been a major disaster, it would have been pretty awful. But I mean, I think the, the worst thing is that she basically underwent this torturous experience and she just can't unlive it, right? So she has visions of it and memories of it recurring because it was so awful and scary. Yeah, and that's gotta be, I mean, seriously, if you think about it, it's pretty traumatizing. <laughs> and she doesn't, get, she doesn't get that slice of her life back. Yeah. So just to summarize our conversation, the top things are choose your surgeon very carefully and get at least two consultations with qualified surgeons. Ask about the surgery, the procedure, the operating facility, anesthesia, risks and possible complications, duration, recovery experience, and the range of results. 
Yeah, make, make sure that you look at photos. I can't stress that enough. You okay. want to see that doctor's work, please. And very important to make sure you're specifically seeing the work of that surgeon and not just generic before and afters of what you can expect from this type of surgery. And I think if it sounds to be good to be true, it's too good to be true and you should walk away. I agree. So is there anything else you'd like to leave our listeners with? No, I just thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. It's been fun. Well, I really appreciate your being here. I always appreciate your wisdom and your input. And and hopefully you'll come back someday and we'll talk again. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Kate. Appreciate it. If you've learned something and like what we're doing, please tell your friends and give us a five-star rating in your podcast app. If you have a question or a crazy story of your own you'd like to share, please send an email or voice recording to info at drkatede.com, that's D-R-K-A-T-E-D-E-E.com, or reach us through the website medspamayhem.com. And read the book. Med Spa Mayhem is available everywhere books are sold. Thanks for listening. This has been Med Spa Mayhem with Dr. Kate D. We are so grateful you're listening, and we hope you've learned at least one fun or possibly disturbing fact today. Don't forget to hit subscribe on your podcast app and leave us a five-star review. And read the book. Med Spa Mayhem is available everywhere books are sold. Links and more can be found in the show notes and on medspamayhem.com. Medspa Mayhem.